Good evening to all of you joining us here in New York, and welcome to all of our guests from around the world. I'm Steve Altman, director of the DHL Initiative on Globalization here at NYU Stern's Center for the Future of Management. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to this event and my honor to introduce our guest, Dr. Shannon K. O'Neill. Thank you, Shannon, so much for joining us. Shannon is... Thank you. Thank you so much. Shannon is the Vice President, Deputy Director of Studies, and Nelson and David Rockefeller Senior Fellow for Latin America Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations. She is an expert on trade, globalization, industrial policy, and the Americas, and she has taught at Harvard and Columbia Universities. Before turning to policy, Shannon worked in the private sector as an equity analyst at Indosuez Capital and Credit Lyonnais Securities. Her most recent book, which will be the focus of our conversation today, is called The Globalization Myth, Why Regions Matter. It was published by Yale University Press in October 2022. Shannon is also the author of Two Nations Indivisible, Mexico, the United States, and the Road Ahead, which was published by Oxford University Press in 2013. Shannon holds a BA from Yale University a, an MA in International Relations, also from Yale, and a PhD in Government from Harvard University. Before we get started, I would just like to mention for our audience that the format of our event today is a fireside chat, in which I'll start by asking Shannon a series of questions, then I'll turn to questions from the audience. Please feel free to submit questions throughout the event using the Zoom Q&A function, and I'll ask Shannon as many of your questions as our time permits. Without further ado then, let's get started. Shannon, first of all, congratulations on the publication of your excellent new book. I've been really looking forward to the opportunity to talk to you about it. But first, I'd like to give our audience a chance to get to know you just a bit beyond the uh, impressive bio sketch that I just uh, read. Could you please start by telling us a little bit about what motivated you to study globalization, regionalization, and international relations more generally? Sure. Well, the, the the short version of the the longer career path was always interested in international affairs, and I was working, as you mentioned, in the private sector and emerging markets. Um, then came back to academia, and during academia, when I was doing my PhD, I read much of the sort of economic development literature. Right? Why did South Korea succeed where you know other countries failed? And so that kind of was the background for me. But this particular project and and what it really came out of is. I work at the Council of Foreign Relations, as you mentioned, and for those who don't know the council well, the council is a mix of things. It is a think tank. Um, so we have 70 plus scholars who are part of the think tank. Um, it publishes foreign affairs. So, you know, you've seen that magazine or perhaps read some of the, the articles there. Um, and it has a membership. And one of the things we do with all those branches is we do these task forces. So institutional projects where we bring together members and scholars and the like together to, to tackle a big issue. And so I was working on one of these. I was the project director for one of these on North America. And what I found interesting was, as we were looking at, you know, security issues and community people issues and environmental issues and, and other kinds of ties um, and commercial issues was really getting at the integration of the three economies. And it's interesting, if you talk to people who look at North America, they really like to tout how integrated North America is and how important Mexico and Canada are for the United States. And it's true, they are, and we'll talk more about that. Um, but when I was taking sort of a step back in the economic data, it became apparent that sure, North America is integrated, you know, about 40% of the trade is between the three countries, but it's not as integrated as other parts of the world. And, and particularly Europe and Asia have a big, you know, miles ahead in many ways. And, and it was sort of that puzzle to me that some parts of the world are integrated together and some are not as much in terms of their trade and their commercial contacts. And some areas are much further along than North America. And does that matter? Does it explain some of the things that we, you know, we ask questions about, like economic development, like economic growth, like competitiveness and the like. So that's sort of where the project came out of um, and really sparked my interest, this idea of this underlying lattice work of supply chains that had developed. And partly also, you know, this was back 2015, 2016 when I was doing it. And nobody was really talking about supply chains, but it became obvious it was a really important part of this whole process. So that's what really spurred um, the research for the book. 
Perfect. Yeah, some some really big uh, topics, and we'll get we'll get into them in 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 just a moment. So let's go straight to the book then, uh, starting with the the really very intriguing title that you uh, chose, the globalization myth: Why regions matter. So why is globalization a myth, and what do you mean by regionalization? Sure. Um, well, there's sort of you know what I found in doing the research is there's sort of two myths of globalization. Um, so the first is that, you know, if you read the news or sort of, you know, all the talks about globalization, there's sort of this sense out there that globalization has been all encompassing. It's, you know, changed all of the world over the last 40 years. And when you start looking at trade flows and money flows and people flows and, and other kinds of things, um, and, you know, I, I will just say from the get go, you know, your DHL service is the, uh, you know, the things that you do is sort of the Bible there, you know, in terms of the connectedness survey and what you have there. So that's the place to go for Thank all you of so this. Much. Kind of stuff. <laughs> Thank um, you. Thank you. But what you find is actually from 1982 to today is that not all that many countries participated in this quote unquote hyper globalization of the last 40 years, right? There are only about two dozen countries, 25 to be precise, that saw trade as a percentage of GDP double or more. So they really transformed their economies from 1980 to today. And in contrast, you have dozens more, 89, um, where trade as a percentage of GDP stayed the same, so it stagnated. Or you even have a good number of countries where trade as part of their economy declined. So you have a good number of countries who deglobalized. And so the glo- one part of the globalization myth is it's not as big as we think, right? Not that many countries participated. For good, for bad, for ugly, not that many countries were actually involved in this. So that's one part. That's a myth, I think. And the other myth is that, and this is really comes to light in your surveys, is when companies went abroad, and indeed they did, right? Trade has gone from $2 trillion to $32 trillion between 1980 and today. When they went abroad, they didn't usually go to the other side of the world. Some did, and we you know, have good examples of big global companies that did go to the other side of the world, but more often than not, they went nearby, they went regional. Um, and when you combine these, not that many countries participated, and those that did when they did, you know, the trade was more likely to be with their neighbors or closer by nations than not. And what you've gotten over these last 40 years are these three big regions. So Europe, North America, and Asia. And between the three of them, 90% of global trade happens. Um, and I think that is something that is really not understood. So the myth of globalization is it's really these three big regions and the rest of the world, South America, the Middle East, Africa, South Asia, you put them all together, you know, India and Brazil and all these big countries in there, they're only 10% of global trade, which I think is really misunderstood. And then it shapes our policy debates in, in funny ways. And we don't really understand that that basis. Yeah, I really appreciate how your book helps to correct uh, really both of these myths that you uh, talked about. You know, as I, and we, you mentioned the DHL Global Connectedness Index that my team produces, and so we we spend a lot of time on on measuring globalization. And most of the questions that I get nowadays are: Is it increasing? Is it decreasing? Is it regionalizing? Is it fragmenting? Uh, but your your first myth uh, gets it at the the question of of how much globalization varies from country to country. And one of the points that I like to make is that. Uh, the changes across the differences in levels of globalization from country to country are much bigger than the changes from year to year. Uh, they're both important to analyze, but uh, but it's uh, it's 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 important to recognize that that levels of globalization vary so much uh, from country to country. And as you said, we can't forget that. I think, or we we misunderstand that. Yeah, and that that even uh, you know for the for the countries that are uh, particularly globalized, most of their flows are are regional uh, rather than uh, rather than global. So let's turn then to the question of of why. So so what are the main drivers of regionalization? And can an understanding of these drivers of regionalization, uh, perhaps at the industry level, help us to understand which are the industries that that really are global? And then which and which are are the ones that are regional? And and why are so many more industries really regional rather than global? So let's let's turn to the question of why and how it varies. So why? And I think the short answer to why is what's different about this most recent phase of quote unquote globalization. And you know, we globalization has been with us for a long time, right? We've had the Silk Road, we've had industrial revolution, we've had, you know, colonialism. There's a lot of times of globalization. It's not as if this is something new, but the globalization of the last 40 plus years was different, or I say distinct for, for a number of reasons, but in particular that it is the globalization of, its key feature is international supply chains. 
And that I think is different than the previous rounds. And, and what that means in terms of trade is that the majority, a strong majority of trade is not finished products. It is pieces and parts and components, things that economists call intermediate goods. And that is where I think the, the key to this regionalization is that, you know, while we may all buy an iPhone all over the world, that seems very global. The actual making of the iPhone is not very global. It is much more regional. And that's where this intermediate good side happens. And the iPhone is not uh, an anomalous in that sense, right? You look at furniture, you look at apparel, you look at shoes, you look at any kind of electronics, you look at all kinds of products that we use. And this, the making of them is very regional often, uh, more so than perhaps the actual selling. And that's where you get these intense regional supply chains. Uh, and also, I think a reason why some countries get left on the margins where they're not included in this whole process is because they haven't hooked in. They haven't taken a particular node on that supply chain or in that supply chain network where they become the specialist on you know, flat screens or they become the specialist on a particular semiconductor or whatever it is, the part that goes into various products. So I really think as we think about why regionalization, that's part of it. There's these economies of scale and specialization and things that build up in particular companies, but also particular countries. And this clustering effect allows with a regional supply chain allows areas of the world to create things so efficiently. So you get high quality and low cost. It's very hard to compete and just start up in another part of the world, especially if you're just a country operating by yourself. So that I think is really, that's where I would say the hallmark of why we see regionalization. Okay. So economies of scale, specialization all help to play into this. And uh, I thought it was important the way you raised here, the distinction between making and selling. Uh, and so there are some particular efficiencies that are involved in, in making goods regionally, even if they're being sold uh, globally. Um, is there uh, anything that you might be able to help to, 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 to lay out about, about what makes some industries global versus other region, others uh, regional? There, I mean, there are there are definitely um, aspects, and you know, some things are more global because the pieces and parts or the inputs come from particular places, right? As we're as we're finding out in our politics today, some critical minerals are only found in particular parts of the world, so that has to be by necessity global. Um, if you're if you're going to make things in other places than where those critical minerals are found, so that's one aspect. Um, I think we also find sometimes the um, less complicated supply chains, interestingly, um, can be more global um, in the sense that you can span time zones, you can span languages, you can span legal systems and, and accounting systems and the like, um, because it's a little bit easier to send commodities or things that are not quite as complicated over, over far distances. Sometimes that's the reverse because you need so many complicated parts, you need them from various parts of the world. But there does seem to be a sense is the more complex Mm -hmm. The building and the teams and the parts that go in, sometimes that distance um, can make it more difficult. And, you know, uh, one you know measure of this that I, I always think is interesting. So McKinsey has a study that they did where they surveyed 600 companies and they find uh, that when companies go abroad, either for customers or suppliers, they're able to increase their profit margins. So they, you know, there's a benefit. Um, but the further abroad they go, then their profit margins start to come back down. And so they, you know, it's McKinsey, so they have to have a good term. So they call it the globalization penalty. Yeah. Um, but this idea that you go far away and, you know, it's a mix of things. It's partly maybe you don't understand your consumer, right? You don't have a natural fit with them. And, you know, we have um, we have great bloopers in history of, you know, Pepsi tried to go into China and they had their next generation campaign. But really what the billboard said was it will raise your ancestors from the dead. And so nobody wanted to drink Pepsi. And so, you know, you have some of those bloopers. But I think more important than things like that in your marketing is, you know, we can talk to people on Zoom on the other side of the world but it's not easy uh, and not easy when you're trying to solve technical problems with time zone differences or cultural differences or language differences. And so building the trust and the, the kind of camaraderie that you need in a very high functioning team isn't always easy to do um, across many time zones and across cultures and the like. So I think there's something about that sort of team building trust. I mean, any management, you you know, at NYU, Stern, you know, they'll talk about, you know, to manage a team, you need certain things to happen. And that's harder to do over, over distance. So, you know, 
sometimes some industries you don't need that kind of touch and you don't need that sort of complexity and problem solving. And so I think those are easier to do over long distance. But if it gets complicated, I think it's it's harder. And that's where you get the regional aspect can can really fill in. Right. So we have this interplay between complexity and the effects of distance and how it varies uh, across businesses, but that in many cases, it turns out to be very efficient uh, to do business within uh, regions where you have countries that are often more similar, often have, uh, as well as having the, the benefits of, of geographic uh, proximity. So many good reasons for uh, doing business regionally. Um, let's let's turn then to different regions of the world and how this has developed and how it compares. So w- one of my favorite aspects of your book is how you explain the different ways that regionalization has developed in different parts of the world. Uh, so I'd like to ask you to walk us through some of your key insights on uh, the different major uh, world regions. And, and we'll save North America for last so that we can go deeper into the opportunities and challenges in uh, this region. So let's start with Europe. How would you characterize briefly the process of regional integration in Europe? So Europe was a very top-down, diplomatically led approach. It started at the end of World War II, and you know, diplomats, statesmen, and women were desperate to not get into a third world war. And so they started finding ways through treaties, through agreements to tie their economies together. So it started with coal and steel, which were, you know, the the inputs to war, they were going to share those broadly. So nobody had a monopoly, you know, not Germany, not France, not anyone. Um, And then they went to, you know, tariffs, they went to regulations, they went to currency differences, they went to passports, you know, and it was treaty after treaty. And so, you know, you go around Europe, and it seems like every big city has a treaty named after them, Treaty of Rome, Treaty of Nice, Treaty of Lisbon, Treaty of Maastricht, right, everybody. And that was, that was European integration. It was, Governments, diplomats getting together and solving some of the economic problems to open up markets to each other. Um, And so that is, uh, you know, in in that they created um, a very robust system. You know, they got rid of not just tariffs, but regulations. They created a European parliament, a European commission, European courts, European central bank, uh, you know, development funds. They really brought integration to an institutional basis as well as just a a market basis. So a very robust and tight. And, you know, lots of people um, talk about, you know, every few years and and justifiably so talk about the end of the EU, how, you know, it's never going to survive a financial crisis or a immigration crisis or other kinds of things. But interestingly, over these, you know, 50, 60, 70 years, Europe has hit many crises. Um, And so far, each time they've hit them, they've decided to double down on integration rather than backup. Um, and so we'll see the next one. Undoubtedly, there'll be one, but but it is interesting that they have continued down that path, um, but continued through diplomatic and treaty means. Great, okay, so we have uh, diplomatically driven integration of Europe through treaties. And uh, I forget who it was who said that the European integration is forged in crises. Um, but that uh, I don't that, remember too, but it but it really is forged in crises. They keep choosing yes, Europe versus no. That seems to be the case. Okay, so let's uh, let's the UK, start. but we'll leave that aside. That can be later on. <laughs> yes, anyone who has uh, Brexit questions will uh, will save those uh, for the end. So let's let's move next over to Asia. So what was different about regional integration in Asia? Asia is almost the opposite in some ways. Asia is a bottom-up model. Uh, And what you saw in Asia is um, starting with Japan, you know, they were rebuilding after the war and the Korean War, they became an industrial base for the U.S. troops and the like. And they quickly ran out of workers. And, you know, the Japanese were the first outsourcers. You know, we talk about that a lot today, but, you know, in 1960, they were looking for workers and they started in, at the time, very poor Taiwan and South Korea. Um, So beginning to put labor intensive factories there that then would feed back to Japanese based factories. Um, And so it was CEOs, it was boards of directors that were were making these decisions. Um, Now governments were along for the ride and and had an assist. So, you know, Mitsubishi or or other, Sony or other companies would say, okay, we're gonna build um, factories in this place. And the Japanese government would come along and say, okay, we'll use our overseas development assistant to build the port so you can get your goods out or we'll help build the industrial park or fund those sorts of things. So you did see cooperation and governments involved but it was much more led by business. And then once, South Korea and Taiwan, you know, gained factories and manufacturing knowledge and technology. They climbed the value added scale. And then they did the same thing. They started outsourcing into 
Thailand into China, into Vietnam. And you sort of see them climb the value added scale and really create these robust supply chains. And it isn't until very recently that free trade agreements and the like became a factor. At the beginning, you know, there were really no free trade agreements and Japan wasn't part of ASEAN and they were really the big funders. Um, in the 90s, they started signing agreements, but many of them didn't have any teeth. So they really weren't the driver. And it's only recently with you know, CPTPP and RCEP and these other arrangements where you might really see the diplomats mattering, but it really has been a much more bottom-up organic and private sector-led initiative. Right. Okay. So in contrast to the diplomats uh, taking the lead in, in Europe, we have the private sector taking the lead in, in Asia. And uh, I, one of the things that I think is, is interesting is how, at least from the perspective of trade regionalization, they, they both were very effective uh, in, in, in leading to robust levels of regional trade that for a long time, and when we in the DHO Global Connectedness Index, when we look even beyond trade at capital flows, information flows, people flows, we'd always say, you know, Europe is the world's most uh, integrated region. But Asia has become more and more uh, into integrated over time. So it, it, it seems to both approaches seem to have, have worked very well. Yeah, there's different paths to this deeper integration. Great. So before we turn to North America, I, I wanted to pause on on the rest of the world. You already mentioned that it's 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 only about ten uh, percent of trade, and so that's that's why you, uh, your your book focuses on Europe, Asia, and in North America. Um, I thought perhaps we could we could just pause to 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 ask about the uh, how you would think about the link between regionalization or the lack of regionalization in other parts of the world and and development. So what what are kind of the policy implications for other other parts of the of the world that aren't in these three uh, uh, mega regions, so to speak. Yeah. So these other parts of the world, you know, South America, Africa, Middle East, South Asia. When you look at their trade flows, only about ten, maybe fifteen percent of the flows go to their neighbors. When they trade, they trade far away. Um, in part, these are you know commodity producers, so they are sending off some of those things. But you know, I think it goes at least a part, maybe a good part, to explaining some of the challenges that they've had in terms of economic development. So, you know, you ask about winners and losers from globalization, and, you know, we often in the United States think about internally, but I would say, you know, some of the countries, many of the countries that have not found these regional chains, have not found themselves as part of the regional hubs, um, have been on the margins of, of sort of economic development and growth. It's part of the reason why they haven't climbed the value added chain ladder, why they haven't you know increased GDP per capita or haven't been able to solve some of their inequality and other issues. And and you know in part what happens in in some of these places. You know I do a lot of work on Latin America, so I'll, you know I'll focus on that. But Africa is a very similar case in the sense is they've been left on the ends of supply chain. So they export the raw materials and they bring back the finished goods. And they never get to the sort of meaty middle part that would allow them to climb, to learn new technologies, to learn you know, managerial skills, to become more sophisticated in their economy, to diversify their economies, and ultimately provide better jobs and, and you know, grow middle classes and the like. And Africa and Latin America are the two regions in the world um, that have suffered the most from what um, Danny Roderick, who the economist calls premature deindustrialization. So losing your manufacturing base before you get out of the middle income trap, right? Before you become a wealthy economy that then becomes a service economy. And, you know, there's lots of reasons why this can happen. And, you know, each country has its own miseries and we can talk about the politics and the like. But I do think the lack of regionalization, the lack of hooking into regional supply chains goes a long way to explaining some of this um, because they never got to the economies of scale or specialization or ability to make products competitively that would have allowed them to sell to the 8 billion consumers around the world. The way, you know, economies that, you know, at the time in 1960, 1970, South Korea, Taiwan, Thailand, they were more, they were poorer than say a Brazil or a Mexico or, you know, some of the countries in South America and, and Argentina and the like. Um, but by hooking into those regional supply chains, they were able to really develop and, and their economies diversify and thrive. And I think that is part of the reason you've seen um, so much of the rest of the world, you know, I don't want to say flounder, but stagnate a bit in terms of their, their development. 
Okay, thanks. And and if we have time at the end, I would love to come back to to Latin America or Latin America and Africa. But uh, to keep on track, let's come to North America. So let, let's start with uh, with how regionalization developed here relative to in other parts of the world, and then we'll come back to possibilities for uh, how to to how this region could move forward. So let's let's look at the development of regionalization in North America. The North America's regionalization, you know, North America is sort of the Goldilocks middle between uh, Europe and 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 Asia, um, but not in a good way. <laughs> the way we, so, you know, it has some treaties. It has NAFTA, and now it has USMCA. So it has a basis, an investment agreement, a commercial agreement, and the like. So it has some of the things that that really um, drove trade or drove connections in Europe. Um, but NAFTA and now the USMCA were are never were never designed to be and have not been. Um, as deep um, and as as important um, in terms of driving trade. Yes, it lowered tariffs. Um, yes, it gave investment guarantees uh, or sort of arbitration in case you know you felt you were being done wrong in the other country and you could go to you know international arbitration and the like. Um, but it was not able to get rid of regulations. Um, so the sort of other kinds of non-tariff barriers and other kinds of costs between the countries. Um, it did not uh, provide, you know, funds for infrastructure that would connect the countries to each other. It didn't, you know, create bigger institutions. You know, there's sort of NAFTA courts, but they're not actually physical courts. They're sort of panels that are put together and the like. And so you don't have the real solid basis that would allow freer commerce that you have, say, uh, in Europe. And, you know, one of my favorite examples, because it just seems at least to me so absurd, is in terms of the regulations that are still there is... Um, that, you know, Cheerios that are uh, made in Canada, manufactured in Canada, cannot be sold in the United States because we just can't get through the regulations to, to sell Cheerios, right? And, and that carries over in so many places. So yes, there's no tariffs on them, but you can't get them through the process um, and the regulatory process to be able to sell them. And so that holds back this integration. Um, on the other side, you know, yes, we have some industries where you really have seen companies take advantage and build really robust regional supply chains. And, you know, the hallmark here, I'd say, in, in North America is the automotive, the, the vehicle. Um, and here you really do see strong and you see very globally competitive chains that, you know, we sell cars here in North America, but also are competitive in, in places all around the world. Um, and so that is a success story. Aerospace has some, you know, success stories as well, where you see production across the three countries that have allowed, you know, Boeing and, and Embraer and Airbus, even and others to be competitive and, and, and really thrive in North America, some processed foods, but, but many other industries that did not regionalize and and many of them have diminished if not left North America. So footwear and apparel and many electronics and furniture, many of those didn't regionalize. They didn't find sort of the economies of scale and specialization. And instead you find that now in Asia uh, rather than in North America. And I think the challenge is could you bring some of those back and set up regional supply chains that could compete with those that are already well established in places like Asia? Okay, so you've laid out some of the successes of regionalization in North America, the automotive industry, and and a few others. But you've also emphasized some of the areas where where North America lags behind in in capturing the the opportunities that are available in regionalization. So uh, I'd like to turn to you know where we could where we could potentially go from here, uh, and. Um, I'd like to see if we could approach it from the perspectives of each of the three main countries in the region to try to get a little bit deeper into how North American regionalization might look different depending on which country you're in, how the regionalization debate might be different and, and how the implications for policy might be different. So, so how about if we, if we start going alphabetical order, uh, let's start with Canada. Uh, how do you see the prevailing debate about regionalization in Canada, and what advice would you offer to Canadian policymakers to try to strengthen uh, the region's integration? So Canada, to me, is actually making strides here, and you know the Canadians know the Americans well. Um, you know, sometimes in America we forget that they are Canadians and they're not just like us, <laughs> but. Um, but they understand our limitations or sort of our politics and, and have worked. Um, they are supportive of regionalization. They've been part of this process from, from the NAFTA days. And what I've seen most interesting, I would say, on their policy agenda is how they have jumped on and embraced and um, accentuated 
uh, some of the changes we're seeing in U.S. policy and particularly the kind of the rise and return of industrial policy mm. in the U.S. And so, you know, one of the biggest initiatives recently was the Inflation Reduction Act, um, which um, isn't all that much about inflation. In fact, probably not so much about inflation at all, but really is about the green transition. Uh, and also, how do you make sure that we have access to um, all kinds of green technologies and the future of, of energy and transport uh, in the United States and North America? And so that bill um, allows an umbrella. You know, it's, many things have to be made here, but the manufacturing has to happen in North America in order to qualify for the subsidies. And, you know, there's some $370 billion that are on the table, perhaps even more, given some of the ways the bill works or the law works, I would say. Um, and the Canadians have one, they negotiated well to make sure they were in that bill. Um, so they were lobbying from the start that, you know, it should be a North American production and not just a U.S., you know, reshoring, but a, but a North American platform. And then two, they've been matching that. So we just saw, you know, Prime Minister Trudeau announce a bunch of, of incentives to ensure that as critical minerals come back to places that the U.S. has free trade agreements with um, in order to qualify as assembly and manufacturing happens, um, that Canada is going to be a player. So as I look at the Canadian policy, I think they already have a pretty strong policy to sort of take where the U.S. is and figure out how it can benefit Canada most. And they're moving forward on that. Interesting. And, and even without some of the formal institutions, they found uh, informal ways to make sure that, that, that they were part of the policymaking process. And uh, and uh, in this sense, in a positive way for uh, the region's integration. Yes. Uh, let's let's turn then to the same question from the perspective of Mexico. How do you see the regionalization uh, debate in Mexico, and what uh, what advice would you offer for policymakers there? Yeah. So Mexico has taken a really different tact, um, I have to say. And you know, it's interesting. You look back historically. And Mexico was perhaps the most eager of the three partners. You know, they were the ones that put NAFTA on the table first. Uh, Salinas came to, at the time, George Bush Sr. And, and, and had this idea, and then it was picked up by him and, and you know, two of his Texan cabinet members, and, and they got NAFTA, you know, got the NAFTA deal done. But Mexico was always pushing for this. And, and a big difference, I would say, with the current administration, the Lobos Obrador administration that's been in, in place for the last four years is... Um, they're much more suspicious of, of regionalization. This is a government that's much more nationalist in, in sort of DNA. Um, they're searching for energy self-sufficiency, even food self-sufficiency. A lot of the policies here are sort of taking Mexico back to a 20th century economy based on commodities and the like, and not, I don't think, grasping nor at least setting up their public investment and the like to, to grasp the sort of advanced manufacturing that's really come to lead Mexico's exports and much of its economy, particularly in the north. So, you know, as I look at this regionalization, um, it's happening despite sort of the place of the federal government or the, the sort of inclinations of the federal government. Uh, and this is where federalism actually I think really matters. You see state level governors and cities, particularly in the north of Mexico, who, which have been the states that have benefited from NAFTA and from USMCA. I mean, you look over these last 30 years and Mexico's overall growth has been about 2%, give or take. Um, but if you start delving into the subnational level, many states in the north have been growing 8, 9, 10, 11% growth. I mean, kinds of rates of growth that China has seen for two decades, the south has not because it's not tied in. So I think the overall challenge for Mexico is one for the federal government to see that this is the engine of growth. This is how you get rid of poverty. This is where you hook in um, and then also put the policies in place, whether it's you know affordable energy, um, whether it's you know investment rules, whether it's all these kinds of things too, or public investment in infrastructure that will tie Mexico tighter to the United States and allow for the logistics. This is the challenge. So um, I would say it is the more reluctant of the three right now in policy. And my recommendation would be to embrace um, rather than shy away from integration. And as a follow-up, and, and you know, you, you may not have the data handy on it, but I, I wonder if you might be able to comment about about public opinion in Mexico, whether the shift that that we've seen uh, with the current administration uh, is in line with shifts that have been taking place in public opinion there, or if it's just uh, you know, um, something that that comes from the ideology of the current administration. Cur curious if you might might be able to go uh, another layer back on on how to understand that shift and and where it might go uh, moving forward. Yeah, you know it's interesting. 
public opinion polls of average Mexicans, so broader Mexicans, um, they feel quite warmly to the United States. You know, those thermometers that they do of various countries, you know, Mexico feels quite warmly to the United States. And particularly, uh, there have been changes over time um, during the Trump administration. And, you know, they didn't feel quite as warmly um, to the U.S. president, um, but they have come back. The elites are a little bit different. So when you see polling and focus groups with elites, um, there is, and particularly among Morena, which is the political party of the president, you know, it's a little bit more nationalist. It's a little bit more left-leaning. It's a little bit more suspicious of the United States. And there is a love-hate relationship often, I think, between the United States and Mexico from the Mexican point of view, right? You you know, there's this old joke about, uh, you know, um, Mex- you know, Mexicans uh, remember too much history and the U.S. remembers not enough history. So Mexicans are still back in the 1800s when we took Texas and and we forget that, the, you know, what happened yesterday sometimes in our in our uh, own government or in our own, you know, kinds of political narratives. So overall here, I think you have there are strains um, within Mexican politics and, and that can be touched on that, you know, the United States is pushing us around or there's suspicions there. Um, but when you poll after poll of an average Mexican, one, um, they, you know, is that they are um, welcoming of the United States, that they feel the United States is a great place to be. They appreciate, you know, our rule of law. They appreciate the ability to get ahead. And you also find that Mexicans that have a tie to the United States. So if they say I have an aunt or uncle or a parent or a friend or whatever, they feel even more warmly to the United States than those who don't have a connection to the United States. So all is not lost. Um, We do have a friendly neighbor, I think, um, but we do have some policy challenges at the moment. Great. Well, then let's let's move on to the United States. So given the the current state of our politics here, uh, what would you what would you see as the best path forward to strengthen regional cooperation from the perspective of the United States? So. Given the politics, because that's where I think we should start, and then we can talk about the pie in the sky things. But to start with the with the politics and where we are is, you know, I think we have a significant opportunity right now um, in the United States, and particularly with, uh, you know, we can talk about this in a minute. But to me, there's a once in a generation fluidity to supply chains happening right now for a whole host of reasons, which we can get to. But what that means is there's opportunity, um, and we have a whole set of policies that have been passed in these last two years that come with, you know, over $2 trillion worth of investment that is gonna go into the United States over this next decade. So whether that's the infrastructure bill, which is a big portion of that, whether that's the chips and science bill, which is focused on semiconductors and some research, whether that's the Inflation Reduction Act, which is about all these green technologies and and, uh, green cars and electricity grids and all of that, there's a huge amount of, of money that's there. And to realize, these aspirations to realize, you know, bringing, making sure supply chains are secure, making sure that we they're not going to be subject to hostile geopolitical actors, um, making sure that you know we have access to the things that we need, and bringing some of those jobs here. We're going to realize to make that all happen. We're going to have to work with others. It's just we don't have a big enough labor force. We don't have many of the inputs, the raw materials and the like. Um, We don't have sometimes the expertise, frankly, to do these things. And if we don't plan on subsidizing these industries indefinitely, which I can't imagine we will do outside of a very few industries, um, they need to be commercially viable. And indeed, they need to be globally competitive. And what we have learned, I would say what we have learned from the last 40 years, if anything else, is It's very hard for any country, the United States, China, any country in Europe, you name it. No country can really create globally competitive products um, and manufactured goods by themselves. That manufacturing has become a team sport across countries. And so you got to find your team. So I would say that mindset needs to shift. And we have all of these resources now at the ready um, that can be deployed for it. Okay. Great. So I'd like to come back in just a moment to the future and 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 where regionalization could be adding. Uh, but first, I'd like to just uh, shift briefly while we're still focused on North America uh, from public policy to business uh, to ask you if you could comment a bit on the business case for regionalization in, in North America. So for most companies, would a shift, for example, from production in Asia to production in North America involve additional costs that would be offset by other benefits that might go into the calculation? Or would it more often just simply reduce costs to bring production into uh, North America? 
So maybe if you could comment a bit on the business logic and, and how you see companies thinking through the, the, the balance of costs and, and benefits involved. So it depends on the industry um, because costs are different. Um, but I would say we're starting to see changes in the cost structures for various companies that make regionalization or moving your global footprint important. And this is sort of, you know, gets a little bit maybe at where you were headed. It was like, what, what's happening? What's the future here? And, you know, when I was doing research for the book, I spent about a month in China in 2019. So I got lucky to do the research before <laughs> the world shut down. And interestingly, already the supply chain managers and others that I was meeting with, they were already talking about moving parts of their supply chain, putting new capacity in different places. You know, they were already starting to see the calculation that had brought them to China 20, 30 years before, at least in some industries, no longer being the same calculation, right? And, and there are a few reasons for that. So one is kind of the, and some, and I would say a lot of these factors have just accelerated during the COVID period. It wasn't covid that brought these to the fore necessarily, but they've accelerated some of these trends. So one is, you know, sort of the rise of automation in manufacturing. So, you know, algorithms and software and sensors and increasingly AI and all these sorts of things make it so that cheap labor isn't as, isn't as important. You need a different labor force for some of these kinds of assembly lines and the like or it's just not as big a part of your overall cost structure. Um, so logistics costs more. So it might be better to be near the markets that you're serving rather than someplace far away where your transportation costs are significant because labor is no longer the sort of the deciding factor. So I think that's one. The other is that demographics started to change, right? So places that were low cost are not so low cost anymore, right? So you needed, if, you, that, if your model is based on low cost labor, then where are you producing may no longer be the most profitable place to produce. So you see, start to see some movement there as well. Um, this is more recent, but I, but I was beginning back then is, you know, worries about climate change and climate footprints. So, you know, we have lots of big, especially multinationals who have made climate pledges. They're going to be climate neutral by 2030 or 2040 or pick your year. And every extra mile that the product they produce travels is adds to that footprint. And so they're trying to lower that and, and, you know, bring down that cost. And then, you know, the real kicker, which started with the Trump tariffs, which are now the Biden tariffs. Um, is geopolitics. Um, and it's not just tariffs, it's, you know, export bans and controls, it's frictions with customs, it's worried about, you know, Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Acts, it's all kinds of different bills and laws and other things that have come in. And so for companies, it's a very long way of saying, so for companies and deciding, you know, where do we go, these are added frictions um, that have been put in place. And then sometimes there's also carrots and, you know, Inflation Reduction Act, all these sorts of things, there's big carrots to move, right? You can get subsidized, you know, if you can if you can win one of these bids for the CHIPS Act, you can have up to 35% of your, your semiconductor fab subsidized by the US government, potentially. Um, and so I think there's a lot of calculation. So it depends on the industries, but you're starting to see movement around, I want to make sure I have access to markets. So free trade agreements matter, um, you know, which, where can I produce that will allow me to get in without regulations or without tariffs or lower levels? Um, am I becoming more automated? Do I have a labor force that can actually do these kinds of things? Um, same with, you know, the demographics. And then you get into the geopolitics. Can I actually ship things from one place to other? Am I going to worry about, you know, sourcing from a place? Will that stop my whole product from crossing in? But will customs stop my product? Or or could they? Is there uncertainty involved that I really need to, to weigh lay? So I think when you add all of this together, you see sort of changing costs. And some are the markets itself, and some are governments putting their fingers on, on the market calculation. But, but I do think, you know, as I said, it's a once in a generation supply chain flexibility it's because all of these factors are, are swirling around. And, you know, on sort of, does, is this inflationary or not? Is it add to costs or not? You know, anytime I think you move supply chains, like I think sometimes in, you know, when we talk about them theoretically and we write books about them or things, they seem, you know, like, oh, you could produce in Malaysia or you could produce in Mexico. But this all comes down to real life interactions. And, you know, supply chains are very sticky because, once you find a supplier that you know can deliver the part you need on Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. for the right price and you know it's going to work, it's the right quality, you're not just going to say, I guess I'm going to move to another country and see if I can find an equivalent producer, right? That The, the uncertainty and the risk, and if you're wrong, your business goes out of business because you lose all of the profits. And so they're very sticky unless pushed um, and your, your you know profit and loss calculations change. And I would say we're seeing some of that change now for all of these reasons. And 
In the short to medium term, that's going to be expensive because there's a lot of startup costs and, and uncertainty and risks, and you're going to make the wrong bet. You're going to choose a supplier who won't follow through or won't be the one that you really wanted, won't be able to do the quality that you wanted. Um, but once you do move the supply chain, I do think whether it's North America or other parts of the world, um, there's a possibility that you can produce as effectively, as efficiently, as competitively um, as you do in some places like Asia today. So I think it's more of the transition costs than the long-term costs potentially. Great. So you you have actually laid out there um, you know, both both some of the business considerations as well as as really the case for for why we might see increases in in regionalization going forward. Unless there's there's anything that that you'd like to add to the case for regionalization going forward, I think. I would, in order to save time for for questions from uh, from our audience, I'd like to just ask you if you see uh, the case for for rising regionalization going forward a as a global case where where we would we would see increases in regionalization all around the world, or do you see, see more prospects for for increases in regionalization in some regions versus other regions, and and if you see. You know, some regions, uh, if you see kind of all regions benefiting, or if you see some regions uh, that that would gain and some regions that might lose. And then uh, just before I, I I turn it to the question from the audience, I would just remind everyone in the audience that uh, you're welcome to, to pose questions. Please uh, do so using the Zoom Q&A function. Yes, yeah, so I think some of these are cross-cutting. Cross -cutting. I, I do think that some of the geopolitics lend themselves to regionalization. Uh, I do think um, some of the flurry of free trade agreements that were signed over this last four or five years also tend them to lead to some regionalization, whether it's RCEP or the African agreement or, or some of the others that we've seen develop. Um, I do think some of the worries about climate change and the policies around climate change, carbon border adjustment mechanisms and other things that will will you know, it will be a cost if you come from far away or you're not producing in a green way. Some of those, I think, will uh, return. You'll see more regionalization because there'll be a desire to have it not too far, you know, maybe not too close because you need competitiveness and economies of scale, but not too far that you have sort of these other kinds of costs. Um, some other things that are happening, though, you know, you could see leading to more globalization, right? As we move from goods being the big part of trade and increasingly services, those can be more diverse. Um, though, interestingly, services, as you well know, are not as flat as you would think, given that there's no cost to transport them. Um, and, you know, that has lots to do with, you know, um, tourism people still like, you know, the vast majority of people who take European vacations are Europeans. Uh, you know, the number one place Americans go when they leave the country is Mexico. People tend to stick a little bit closer, um, similar with education and the services there. Um, and then geopolitics is affecting services, right? Go to China and try to access your Facebook account or Google or Netflix or all kinds of stuff and you can't do it. And, and same with some of the Chinese social media and other services. So I think we're still going to see some of, of that fragmentation. But who's going to benefit out of this? Um, I This is an opportunity for all those regions that weren't part of the last round, right? This is, a, this is an opportunity for South America, for Africa, for South Asia, uh, for the Middle East. Um, and, you know, some places uh, seem to be inching forward into realizing that, um, you know, you see India making a big push to be the, the place um, that those who are leaving China go to, um, though they have their challenges within. Um, other regions, I don't quite see them making the shift. Um, and, and I worry that they'll end up on the, again, on the ends of the supply chains that won't allow them to really benefit from the, you know, economic growth and, and, and trade that's happening. Um, I do think uh, North America has a potential to to be a winner here, but um, but all three countries have to kind of get their oars in the in the you know in the water and 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 pull together, which you know politics sometimes can lead astray. Yep. Well, so let's let's turn to some of the questions from the audience. We have several questions uh, already here, uh, so let, let's go first to one that actually looks at at shifts uh, across locations over time. So, uh, Stephen asked the question: In the past hundred years, we saw manufacturing shifting from the U.S. to Japan, to China, now to Southeast Asia. As more developing countries begin to develop their manufacturing capabilities and compete in price with each other. Do you think it would be inevitable for globalization to grow, albeit slowly? So kind of uh, how, how do you see these geographic shifts and the implications for globalization? So what's happening, I mean, that would seem, right, the path that 
you know, was the industrial revolution in Europe and then the U.S. took and then perhaps, you know, Japan took and the like. This was a path or much of Asia took. This was a path where, you know, you start out with labor intensive industries and then you learn some skills and, and then you climbed up the value chain and then you got a little bit more sophisticated and then you kind of kept going up until you became very sophisticated and you went, you know, in Taiwan from sewing buttons onto clothes to now making the most sophisticated semiconductors. And that, that's the success story, right? And that was sort of the path you saw, you know, from the 1800s all the way through, some faster than others. And what I worry about in this question is, I'm not sure, you know, in, in uh, financial prospectuses, they say, you know, past performance is no guarantee of future, you know, future performance. And what worries me here is when I look at the transformations that are happening to manufacturing today is that I do wonder if that very labor intensive layer that got, got you on the first rung of that ladder or the second rung on the ladder, if that's even going to exist anymore. Um, and, and, you know, you'd have to jump straight into a very, you know, middle level technology or even higher. And, you know, one of the examples I, I see out there, um, which, you know, I highlight in the book because I think it's a kind of a fascinating example is um, the case of Zara. So Zara is a global fast fashion brand. You probably all have seen it. You know, if you're at NYU, there's a store within, you know, 10 blocks, you can go check it out on, I think on Broadway. Um, and it is the biggest fast fashion brand. It sells half a trillion dollars worth of goods every year. It's also the most profitable fast fashion brand in the world. And the way they do this is they produce almost all of their clothes in Europe. They only produce about 10, 15% in Asia and just basic t-shirts. And so they use a mix of automation and computerization and digitization um, to make these clothes in high wage, high environmentally, you know, protected types of environments. Um, and they do it in small batches and then they get it to stores in three weeks, not three months. Um, and they don't have to mark things down because they, they have so much turnover. And so Sure, you have different equilibriums, but I see that, you know, the most cutthroat of industries, the one that's known for being so labor intensive, they found a way to do it without that. And if you take that across so many industries, you know, go to the car industry um, and there's more robots than there are people in, in most plants. And I think, you know, 10 years from now, they'll be even it'll be even more stark. Um, so. I'm not sure that avenue is going to be open for those countries that have yet to, you know, rise in manufacturing. And I think a telling sign is, you know, back to this premature deindustrialization. Countries like Brazil or others that used to have manufacturing sectors, they're losing it even before they're able to really climb the manufacturing scale. So I'm a little bit worried that the past 100 years or even more than that, almost 200 years of manufacturing, of sort of economic development, that path may close or, or not be as open as it once was. Thanks. I'd like to turn to a question from uh, Patrick, who says, you've, you've touched on this a little uh, and would love to hear more. Regulators in many countries have increasingly pushed companies to engage in, in better human rights and environmental due diligence uh, on their supply chains. Do you see this as a threat to globalization, an opportunity, or somewhere in between? I think it will come out in different places. Um, I mean, on the one side, if you want access to the European market, which is you know almost 500 million people and a very wealthy market, um, you see increasingly you have to have you know supply chain due diligence. You have to do other you know there's other kinds of things you have to do that um, should raise environmental and labor standards. You know there's deforestation issues and, and you know are ways that you have to meet particular you know preserving of the environment and the like. And so. In many ways, it may be a way to make sure that countries that are climbing um, are growing um, and, and, and rising in terms of, of GDP per capita and the like. It may make ways that it is better for the people within, right? It's not on the backs of, of those that are in the, you know, making sure that the quality of those manufacturing jobs is better and, and those people lead better lives faster. Um, so I think there can be benefits to some of these if big consumer markets say we're only going to buy, you know, we're only going to buy the Nike shoes if the factory where they're made is actually treats its workers well. Um, because you know what, I here in New York, people are still willing to pay $200 for those Nike shoes. So let's make sure that the workers get at least a part of that and the quality of their life is better. So I think there's some areas where, where you see that. Um, but there are challenges, right? And I think here is the, the the challenges sometimes in places, especially places that are still at the lower end of, you know, the World Bank in terms of incomes and the like is 
to you and I, those manufacturing jobs would seem like a terrible place to live, but it's much better than subsistence agriculture where they come in. And so I think there's sort of a challenge there um, as you as you move forward on whether or not um, on how we do and on how you make sure that human rights and labor issues and environmental issues are, are wrapped up in here. And I think the last thing I'll say is, you know, I, we are seeing numbers of countries come together in uh, more robust, I would say, free trade agreements um, that put all that stuff in there. Um, and it's sort of you're opting into a different kind of approach. But when you get regional free trade agreements or free trade agreements that include a group of people that have agreed to particular labor, environmental and other standards, um, the other countries are left out. Those that aren't signed on, you know, they're left out and they're much less competitive in those markets. So you could imagine um, many countries um, not able to grow, not able to, by not being able to access those markets, they might not have a path to greater prosperity that they might have had um, without that. Thanks. I'd like to pose a question from Jacqueline, uh, which gets a little bit at the boundaries between the regions and, and how we think about it, as well as competition between different regions. So uh, Jacqueline asks, uh, can you see South, Amer South America becoming a region with North America? Many American companies outsource to India. Couldn't they outsource to South America uh, instead? I think there's, there's two, two issues together there. Yes, exactly. Uh, you know, I think there's an opportunity for sure. Um, and particularly in, in industries and, and like the um, electric vehicle car battery industry, the critical minerals that go into that. Um, one of the amazing benefits of the Western Hemisphere is that it has a huge bounty in all of the green critical minerals that one needs for sort of this, this green transition. So I think that is a benefit. The other benefit is that the United States, interestingly, has fairly few free trade agreements around the world. Um, you know, we only have preferred access to about 10% of the globe's GDP. Um, and many of those agreements, the majority of those agreements are in the Western hemisphere. So you already have connections uh, in terms of lower tariffs, in terms of investment guarantees, you already have that with a dozen plus nations in the Western hemisphere. So that is an easier way to do business. So I think in terms of this integration, regionalization, you already have at least a, a floor um, that you could take advantage of, which we don't have, for instance, with India and other places and sometimes gets, gets companies into trouble. So I think it's a beginning the challenge I would say is kind of back to the, you know, to keep going back to regionalization, but these countries in South America aren't working with each other. They don't have sort of the cross-border integration or workforces or, or clusters in terms of, of industry. And so alone, a country of 20 million people or 50 million people or a workforce that is not as attractive for a multinational that's really trying to build a very efficient, high quality, affordable kind of product. And so if South America could come together more and allow, you know, pieces and parts to move easily across, you know, whether it's trade agreements between themselves or infrastructure that would connect the countries and, you know, whether it's ports and roads and rails and digital infrastructure, that's how I think um, that would become a reality. Thanks. I'd like to, in our in our last few minutes, see if we can take one or two more questions. A uh, question from Nicholas. Uh, Nicholas asks, uh, can you talk about shifts in Europe as a result of the of the war in Ukraine? Uh, what does the long-term outlook uh, look like? So with the war in Ukraine on the positive side, I would say, is the impressive uh, cohesion that Europe came together. I mean, a once in a century, maybe shock, or maybe a little bit less than that, but decades, you know, shock to their energy systems, um, to sort of, you know, existential threat. And you saw Europe really come together. I think Russia was surprised. I think they thought Germany would go with them because they had their control of the gas and, and they did not. <laughs> and, and so I think you have on the one side, you have a pretty cohesive Europe with the United States also, you know, NATO became a real thing again and it was tested and, and I think stood, stood together. Um, so that's one side. Um, you also have, while in the, after, in the aftermath of the invasion, you saw um, many countries revert to coal or other fossil fuels as you were desperate to, you know, heat houses and keep factories going. Um, you've actually seen Europe really double down on the green agenda. Uh, and so doubling down on solar, doubling down on wind, doubling down on renewables, on hydrogen and the like. So I don't think it's going to slow the green transition. And Europe has been a leader in that. And I think it will continue. Um, so, so that part, I think we're seeing sort of Europe uh, move forward. Um, I also think it will mean a 
I mean, I don't want to say permanent because, you know, that's too long. Life on earth is a long way, but um, it's hard to imagine, I think, in in our lifetime, um, Europe turning back to Russia. I think this is really a hard break. And so Europe will be looking towards other parts of the world. We're not going to see a forgive and forget in five years. I don't think that's a cost. And then the final one that we don't know, but I do think will be taxing for Europe as well as the world is if and when we get to an end to all of this is the hundreds of billions of dollars or trillions of dollars in rebuilding Ukraine. Um, and, and how do you sort of bring that country back to, to a country that can, can have all those people and, and back to what it was? So um, I think it's a huge challenge for Europe, but like past challenges, I think it has actually brought Europe together rather than driven them apart, at least so far. Thank you. Well, I see, I, I was thinking we might get one more question, but we've reached the end of our time. So so we'd like to really thank you uh, so much, uh, Shannon, for joining us today and for this really wide ranging uh, conversation on globalization, regionalization, supply chains, geopolitics, business, uh, business considerations, and so on. This has been really fantastic. So thank you so much for joining us. Great. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you also to uh, to all of uh, all of our guests, to everyone who joined us. Uh, we'd love to welcome you back for future events. So if you aren't already on our mailing list, I'd encourage you to sign up at stern.nyu.edu slash globalization speakers. Again, thank you all for joining us. Wish you all a great rest of the day. Uh, goodbye. Mm-hmm.